Well, it is a grand tradition. If you take a look at who's performed in this theater over the years, wow, every famous actor or actress has been here at one time or another. And we'd like to keep that up. We'd like to uh, bring that reputation up to where they want to come here. I think that's possible. The history of the Paps Theater begins on the corner of Wells and Water in 1895. Beer Baron Captain Frederick Pabst spared no expense, giving Milwaukee what news accounts of 100 years ago called a theater unsurpassed in the United States. The city of Milwaukee is now out of the theater business, selling it to philanthropist Michael Cudahy's nonprofit foundation. I've always been interested in show business in the first place, and in the second place, uh, some people may say that I'm a little nuts to do this, but I consider it an absolutely a jewel, um, an icon of Milwaukee. And it's like, you know, I own the Cudahy Tower. I bought it. Everybody thinks I inherited it, but I bought it because I think it's part of Milwaukee. And, uh, you know, if somebody doesn't step forward and do something about these icons, they'll disappear. And I don't know how long the city was willing to put up with losing money and uh, doing what they were doing. And I'm not willing to lose money forever either. I want to make that clear. I'm going to straighten it out. I think, you know, the city wasn't in a position to do entrepreneurial promoting. And I think there's a lot of, I think we can fill that theater up uh, very nicely. You have to get out and sell. You got to say, I can, you know, not I can't. There's a minor amount of things we have to do to the theater to make it good. I think we need some talent in the way of um, selling our theater uh, in New York and wherever uh, shows uh, are, are booked. I think we need people down there that uh, can say, hey, uh, uh, this is interesting, come down and see me. and." And we have to sell them. You have to sell the Babs Theater. That's what entrepreneurialism is about. Walking into the old theater today is like stepping back in time. Its unique architecture, elaborate ornamentation and furnishings, and acoustics have brought the theater national renown. Cudahy says he wants to preserve that for future generations to enjoy, as he has. Oh, I can vaguely remember as a kid just being awestruck, you know sitting up in the balcony somewhere. I think I have a vague recollection when I was a kid. I was told to shut up and sit down, and I looked, and I just was, ah, what a place. And it is, what a place. Michael Cudahy had already donated $1 million to the $9 million renovation of the historic theater. In return, a glass-enclosed addition to the lobby was named Cudahy's Irish Pub. The idea to buy the entire building for a dollar came up during lunch with the mayor. Oh, this is this guy Luber again, you know, my buddy Fred Luber. He's always getting me in trouble. <laughs> and uh, he said, what you ought to do now is buy the Paps Theater. And I said, Freddie, you, you shouldn't drink at noon here. Really, get you off the track here. And, but then I got into it and I got talking to the mayor about it. and. Uh, you know, this business comes up about, oh boy, such a deal for a dollar. I want to tell you that there's more than meets the eye there. It's a dollar and other considerations, if you know what I mean. And the other considerations are, it's got to stay as a, as a theater. Uh, it can't be uh, drastically changed in its appearance. Of course, I wouldn't want to, but, um, and then, uh, it is a losing proposition at the moment, a couple hundred thousand dollars a year. And there's where the entrepreneurialism comes in. We hope that some of that will bring it back to, uh, to round zero. City officials had said keeping the PAPS could have cost taxpayers $4.9 million over the next 20 years. The PAPS Theater hosts about 200 music, dance, and theater performances every year. Cudahy says his intention is to make it even busier. And to do that, he wants to improve the sound system and those facilities that will attract performers, as well as patrons. If an artist comes here and says, I had a great crowd, it was a great theater, but yuck, was it terrible backstage. That's bad. 
because um, they might not come back. They might go to their agent and say, don't book me there again. I couldn't stand it down there. I think we can fix that up with a minimal amount of cost. I think they, that was intended to be uh, remodeled with the great remodeling program, but they ran out of money. And I don't think it's going to be that much to get it right. We proudly announce that we don't have any more smokestacks around here. And I keep saying, OK, wise guy, what are you going to do now? <laughs> but I think the arts are certainly a, um, we seem to have a flair for the arts here, don't we? You know, um, I love jazz. And uh, one of the things, Tom, that uh, Milwaukee was famous for some years ago was jazz. Uh, Chicago, Milwaukee, New Orleans, those were the jazz hubs. And I don't see why that isn't possible again today. So I think the arts of the performing arts certainly uh, uh, can have a great chance at improving our image even further right here in this theater. If we're not going to have heavy industry, we better have art. <laughs> I think that uh, there's a lot, though, that, that uh, Milwaukee can expand on in the arts, and uh, this, is a, this is a hub. Nobody has uh, come to me and said what you should have here. Um, I hope they're leaving that up to me and to some good advisors that I hope I surround myself with. The deal with the city requires that the Pabst Theater retain its name, that it remains a public theater. Its historic designation prevents major structural changes. The city also retained the rights to buy back the Pabst, if Cudahy ever wanted to sell it. You know, I've, I'll tell you just one thing, Tom. I've, I've received literally uh, almost hundreds, I guess, of uh, letters of congratulations from people I don't even know, saying, wonderful, great that you bought it. We're really proud of you. We hope we preserve it because we love it. And uh, that's a good saying. Is it a magnificent? Is it terrific? It's everything. It's, it's a, a hub of showbiz. It's a great place. It really is. Early April, there were still snow showers, but that didn't discourage these young anglers. And they were able to enjoy better fishing at the park lagoons because of the stocking efforts of Milwaukee County and the Department of Natural Resources. <laughs> the DNR and Milwaukee County House of Corrections stock 22 urban fishing waters in the county with rainbow trout and panfish. Urban fishing spots are small lakes and ponds under 25 acres with shoreline access. Well, the urban parks that we have here in southeast Wisconsin, and there are over 50 of them that we have, have a, a special set of regulations that are geared towards kids. We have a fishing season in the spring that runs from the second week in, second Saturday in March to the third Saturday in April, where it's, fishing is for kids only and certain disabled anglers. But we manage these ponds to give kids, especially city kids, an opportunity to find out what fishing is all about. The fish stocking program is also done early in hopes of providing good fishing for the kids' fishing clinics held during April each year. A couple of thousand kids take part. We think it's important in order to teach a, uh, a craft or a recreation that people can use for a lifetime. And what's really neat is you see the generations um, out here, grandfathers with their uh, grandchildren, teaching them lessons. And uh, it's something that, that's unique to an urban area because uh, in other cities, they don't have the, uh, the ability to get out and fish basically a, a few blocks from their house. So it's something that we're really proud to be able to provide. The DNR stocks this year will be over 75,000 rainbow trout and their average size is uh, right around nine inches, a little over nine inches. Um, there are over 50 ponds that get stocked. The Milwaukee County House of Corrections will stock panfish in the clinic ponds only and only in Milwaukee County. So there are nine clinic ponds in Milwaukee County that will get stocked with panfish. And uh, the Milwaukee County House of Corrections fish hatchery also stocks a limited number of larger rainbow trout, 15 to 20 inches. Rainbow trout are easier and less expensive to raise than say a panfish or a perch for example, which would be a high quality fish. But people really like rainbows, they, they fight good, they taste good. 
they're readily available and you can you can raise a rainbow to this size in about a year whereas a panfish would take uh, several years to get to a catchable size. Kids don't need a license and adults would need a general fishing license and a trout stamp. Now parents can take kids to the ponds and, and assist them in fishing but if the parents are actually doing the fishing then they have to be properly licensed. After April, kids and adults are welcome to drop a line in Milwaukee County's urban fishing spots, check the waters for daily bag limits. Three trout, one game fish, and ten panfish. No size limits. Remember to stay on the shore, no boats allowed. You know, most of them are quite small, and if you had boat traffic out there, it probably would interfere with the, with the shore fishing access. And that's really the beauty of it, is that they're in, for the most part, they're in parks and they're easily, there's good parking and they're easily accessible from shore and there's not a whole lot of places around here anymore where you can have good fishing right from shore. We do have a couple of lagoons where we have pleasure boating and again that's purely pleasure boating. We do not allow any kind of watercraft, whether it's motorized or non-motorized, in our lagoons and that's a safety issue. We certainly don't want people to uh, have any accidents and uh, people probably aren't aware that these uh, lagoons can be as deep as 20 feet. If you don't think you'll fish much this year but would like to try, there is a free fishing weekend coming up with no license required. There's a weekend coming up first Saturday of June that's a free fishing weekend that's statewide for all kinds of fishing statewide. So that's a good opportunity for somebody that has a family that maybe the only time of the year that they're going to fish they can go out there and enjoy it without having to worry about having a fishing license. Fish stocking and regulation information are available in the 2002 Fishing Regulation Handbook and on the 24-hour Urban Waters Fishing Hotline at 414-263-8494. You can call 257-6100 for the names of the parks offering fishing. So pack a cooler, grab your cane poles, reels, and the bait of your choice, and head for the urban fishing spot near your home. It's all an effort to enhance the county's quality of life. No doubt about it. Uh, as I mentioned, this is an opportunity for people to walk out of their house in an urban environment and walk a couple of blocks to the park and actually take in some real wholesome recreation and it's something that they'll keep for a lifetime. The best way to describe it is that it, it's an opportunity to expose kids, especially city kids, it is our, we do call it the urban program, expose them to, to, to what fishing's all about where they might not otherwise have an opportunity to find out what fishing's about and they can make their choices from there if it's something that they enjoy and want to come back and do again we have the DNR has a rod loaner program where we'll borrow, borrow rods out to groups like scout groups or teachers. We can borrow fishing equipment out and with the stocking program and the kids clinics that, that take place, it's just an opportunity to try to pass fishing on to another generation. I, I'd also like to mention that, that these, the kids fishing clinics that we do is run entirely by local fishing clubs. Now it's all volunteer effort and the, the spirit of volunteerism is, is really great. These people give of themselves, these men and women of the fishing clubs give of themselves and do a great job of teaching kids what some of the basics of fishing. The short, hilly street that gives the neighborhood its name was known as Menominee Drive until the name changed in 1928. You'll find it just west of the growing Badger Association for the Blind on Holly Road. It's a private neighborhood. The Menominee River runs along its northern boundary, Jacobus Park to the west. Streets that dead end. Residents say it's the best of the rural and the urban. That's great. We're a few minutes away from downtown, and we have all the comfort of suburban life. Well, and in many ways it is. I wouldn't say suburban, but it almost has a kind of a rural or woodsland character to it. Uh, and I think it's, it's one of these, and there are other neighborhoods like this in Milwaukee, these little pocket neighborhoods that have some unique uh, natural characteristics. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's a delightful neighborhood. It's, it is like living in the woods, as you saw all the, the, the oak, old oak trees and the Menominee River running through it and Jacobus Park on one side and yet we're just 10 minutes from downtown and we're just a walking distance from uh, Miller Park so it's got all the amenities of urban life and uh, and also the amenities of living in the woods. Valley Forge is on the edge of the city. Only five blocks from 55th to 60th, only four blocks from Wells to Trenton and the river. Some of its children go to Hawley Environmental School. 
the MPS specialty school with a focus on environmental issues. Residents vote there. Nearby, one of the oldest buildings, a home at 55th and Wells, dating to 1890. It's really friendly. Uh, we know all our neighbors and we love them. Uh, we don't require a particular political stripe, but uh, we respect one another in you know, whatever our beliefs are. Uh, we like to share our gardening. We trade plants a lot with our neighbors. Um, we have a nice neighborhood association. Our neighborhood association actually straddles um, Tosa and Milwaukee and it's the Charles Jacobus Neighborhood Association. Charles Jacobus was the founder of Wauwatosa Fuel and Supply in 1919, later Quick Flash. Building one of the finest county park systems in the country was a favorite cause, and it's one reason the park is named for the man who was a county supervisor for 26 years. The rolling hills, the street that plunges into the park, the wooded ravines behind homes on Valley Forge, all a reminder of Wisconsin's past glacial age. It kind of gives you an appreciation of what uh, the glaciers did, you know, through these riverbeds. Because, yeah, once you get into the, to the riverbeds, it really, it does create some interesting topography. That topography includes this wooded hillside, which is officially, at least, a city alley. Yeah, it was pretty funny. I don't think the, uh, the people who designed this area knew about the topography. And so they had, them, they had an alley designed. There's supposed to be an alley back there, but in fact there isn't. There's just a utility pole with a lot of utility lines. And so we get to share that, that space with our neighbors. The milwaukee Wawatosa boundary runs through the area. It's most evident in the different colored street signs but some of the border cuts right through the yards of some homes along 60th Street. You'll notice that a sidewalk suddenly ends and there's a, there's a fire hydrant and it ends in the middle of somebody's yard and that would be an indicator of the, the border of Wauwatosa and Milwaukee. So they didn't, they didn't have the borders line up with the streets. Actually there's a couple houses on 60th Street which actually share that where the, the lot line runs through the house and the, the property owner pays taxes to both uh, communities. I don't know if they get to vote in both communities, so that's an interesting question. <laughs> the answer, the resident can decide in which community to vote, and that decision can't be changed. Valley Forge has a couple of commercial buildings along Holly Road, otherwise it's residential couple of apartment buildings and a wide variety of housing styles. It's got a lot of interesting architecture, a little bit eclectic. You know, we live in a colonial house. The house next door to us was actually uh, Art Deco type construction. Actually, my brother lives just three doors down from us and he has a house that was built by an architect uh, years ago, so it, it, it's very unique. I mean, each house was unique because I think they were mostly custom built houses unlike in some neighborhoods like Sherman Park where they did whole tracks of houses. So yeah, every house is very unique. The houses go on the market and they're usually passed on through word of mouth and so it's very rare to see a for sale sign. Residents are protective of their neighborhood, which they say has been a well-kept secret. I think the people who live in this area like being part of the city even though we have a little cul-de-sac and it's a private suburban-like environment. We like being attached to the city and we're fiercely supportive. You probably heard this from some of the other neighbors. We don't even want to tell people where it is because it is such a hidden treasure that we don't, uh, you know, it is really special.